Hello, and welcome to the second episode of Profiles of Endurance. I'm Father Scott Vanderveer. In our last episode, we spoke with a mother about the crushing grief of the loss of a child. Today's episode is very different than that, but it also requires the virtue of endurance. And it is very important that we talk about this topic right now. What does a business owner or manager do when the decisions they're being advised to carry out for the good of the organization would hurt some of the very people that have been working there for years right alongside of them as they built the business or organization into what it is today? That is the exact situation that today's guests found themselves in. They were the owners of a locally based aeronautics company during the incredible tragedy of September 11th, 2001, when the airline industry shrunk overnight to almost nothing. The good advice that they got from their management team was to lay off a large number of workers in order to hunker down and survive the crisis. But doing that would have hurt the very people they share a community with. As Christians and as fellow citizens with these folks, their conscience would not allow them to do it. What do you do then? Listen to this fascinating conversation and share it, if you would, with people who need to hear how people of integrity and conscience find their way through times as difficult as the ones we're in now. Today, I'm sitting with Hugh and Peggy Quigley, who had a family business that grew into being a pretty important employer in our small town here in Cooksaki, New York. And that business went through an experience that required some real innovation and ingenuity that had the power to really affect people's lives. So I am so glad that they're here with me now. And I'd like to start by hearing about the company. Uh, Hugh, you're an engineer, so you you do things that I don't fully understand, but your company was called Dynabil. What did Dynabil manufacture? Well, first, thank you for having us. Um, Dynabil Industries um, was homegrown here in Cooksaki. And officially, it was a contract manufacturer for the aerospace and defense industry. Mm. Uh, Dynabil manufactured sheet metal products for most um, every airplane that's out there and did also commercial work as well as defense work. Now, when, when you made those parts, did you have competition also making those parts? Oh, sure. There was, comp- there was domestic competition throughout the United States. And because we did business with all the airplane manufacturers in the world, we had global competition. Wow. So yeah. it, it, was, it, was a, it was a seriously competitive business. How, when, when did you start? When did you start? How did it get going? Well, uh, Dynable Industries was started in 1977. Mm. And, and I'm guessing you were about three years old. <laughs> yeah, I was a little baby. <laughs> I was. So, yeah, so it was about 24 years uh, before 9-11 happened. So t- how did you decide to, to start a business? You, you're an engineer by, by uh, education and, and trade, so uh, you could have had a job working for a, a company or doing research. I imagine many, many things. Am I right? You were a bridge inspector uh, at Correct. one point. So what got you, what, what caused you to be willing to take the risk of being an entrepreneur? That's a really good question. I think both Peggy and I are true entrepreneurs. Both Mm. our parents, my parents and Peggy's parents were entrepreneurs. My parents are immigrants. Both parents are from Ireland. And they knew nothing um, other than having their own business. Uh. So I I think it was in our DNA, both of us. Uh. And we never felt comfortable. I never felt comfortable working in a huge uh, civil service uh, opportunity that I first had. So uh, this this was perfect for myself. And Peggy, whose father was an, an entrepreneur, uh, certainly supported that decision. What does the word Dynabil mean? <laughs> 
it's, it's a little it's a little bit self serving. Um, Dinah is a prefix, uh, which would mean dynamic, I guess. And Bill was a brother, an acronym for brother in law. But and my, my yeah. business partner, yeah, my business partners were brothers in law. So um, perfect. We, I mean, that's it. Shows it just goes to show what a family homespun beginning this had. Correct. Yeah. Uh, Peggy, talk to me about being married to an entrepreneur. You guys took a gamble, like all entrepreneurs do in this business. Talk about the early days. You, you, you had now 1977. You had two children at that time. Yeah, we had two little ones, 74 and 76. They were born, mm. and uh, it was kind of scary because he was working for the New York State Thruway at the time, and it was a civil service job and very secure with all types of benefits. But we sat down and we talked about it, and um, we decided to try it, and we put everything on the line. I can remember my sisters and I, we sold our high school high school rings, and oh. we sold children. We, we did everything we had to do. We cut back. I can remember, I worked for the census back then. I, don't, I must have gone house to house. Oh. So we did we did what we had to do. Wow. And, um, yeah. Yeah, it was it was a family decision. We sat down, we talked about it, and again, because I had come from a, a parent who had started a business, I kind of knew if you work really hard, sometimes it pays off. Yeah. Well, so you worked really hard, and I'm just doing the math. So we we kind of gave a little indication that this story involves September 11th, 2001. So 1977 to 2001, this this organization had been going and growing, and you'd been investing in it for 25 years or so. Correct. All right. Talked. Now, this is, you already told us this was, you know, aeronautics. So we know all of us here that were alive at the time know what a devastation September 11th was on every level. Talk to us about what September 11th did to your business. Sure. Um, and it's, it's, it's very, very vivid in my memory. Um, it was devastating and it was very swift. It was so fast. Um, on that day, which is a Tuesday and that Tuesday will be important in a few moments. Mm. Um, all airplane, all airplane traffic stopped worldwide mm. and our customers within 24 hours and customers like Boeing, Airbus, Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, Sikorsky, Within 24 hours, they absolutely stopped us from making deliveries to them mm. and said, stop making parts for us. You're not going to get paid for them. And we think this is going to last three to four months. Whoa, 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 whoa. How many people did you employ at that time? Um, it was about 220. Here whoa. Whoa. And a lot of these folks, they're your neighbors. They live in this area. They are, these are, this is a, this is, I mean, for a town our size, this is a major employer in our town. Correct. Yep. Oh, yep. all right. So you had to, you had to have meetings to figure out what to do. I know that as, as we're recording this, you know, the, it's the middle of the coronavirus epidemic. We were saying that you are have been in quarantine for longer than most because you were out of the country for a little while. So now you're going on five weeks in quarantine. I've been, I'm an essential worker, so I can't be in quarantine, but I've been completely removed from, um, from normal life for three weeks myself. So we're in a time when... Uh, the economy is is just falling apart also. And I know that as a pastor, I'm having meetings with trustees, with finance councils to try to figure out what to do. How are we going to make payroll when there, there are no collections every weekend? How are we going to meet our expenses? So I'm wondering, when that first week of September 11th, what kind of advice were you getting and your business partner getting about what you needed to do? Um, yeah, that, that question really says it all. And it happened so fast. Uh, it, it was a Tuesday. And by Wednesday, Thursday, it was getting confirmed that everything was stopping. We we're going to have to go three or four months without any revenue from our commercial customers. We did have defense customers that we're going to pay. But we thought we would lose 30 to 40, maybe as much as 50% of the work for our company. So 
we had never been through anything like this. And mm. I think traditional wisdom would say, if you're going to lose 30, 40% of your work, we're going to have to lay off 30, 40% of our employees. Right. So my partner and I, Mike, both of us, um, had a pretty progressive way of running the company. We had a management council that reported to the two of us. Mm. And Friday, uh, just before the weekend, we had a management council meeting and they presented us with a well thought out plan with all sorts of spreadsheets that would oh. have a reduction in workforce of about 30% of the company. And we would uh, enact this on Monday morning after the weekend. Oh boy. And Mike and I kind of looked at each other. You know, we weren't totally surprised with this recommendation, but we both had that awful feeling in our stomach. Oh. And we, we adjourned the meeting on Friday evening, and both of us went home late, and we were pretty upset. Oh. And um, it, it was just awful, um, you know, that, that, that whole period of time. But it was fast. It was really, really quick. Mm. So, so, so that's what the, that's how it started. So that weekend, you're, I mean, that's a, that's a hellish weekend for a business owner. You are mulling this over. I don't know how you were sleeping. I wouldn't be surprised if you weren't sleeping well at all. And, uh, as the weekend went on, you were, uh, you, you had a moment where a new thought entered. Can you talk to me about that? Sure. Uh, it, it was Sunday of all days. Uh, both Peggy and I went to church. Uh, the seven thirty, or eight, I think it was eight o'clock mass then, hmm. and um, we were sitting in church, the two of us. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to flip this over to Peggy uh, for let her answer this because uh. she really what can't what comes next uh, really is something that she thought of. So Peggy, uh. why don't you take over? Well, it wasn't exactly that I thought of it, but we were sitting in church on Sunday and started to look around, and as you said before, it's a small town, and we love this town. Mm. It's been our home, and we feel very attached to the people in town. And we started to look around church, and we started to realize the impact that this decision would have on our neighbors, our friends, uh. our fellow parishioners. And it was it was so disheartening, and and we were so depressed. So we kind of I don't know sat there and. I, I, I would like to think it was divine intervention. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh, that at some point we decided this we can't do it this way. There there has to be a better way. Uh. And so we we came out of church on Sunday with the idea that yeah this wasn't going to happen. We're going to come up with another way to accomplish something. And so 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 what happened was after church, uh, both Mike and I were talking all the time. My business partner mm. and, and the two of us just started talking. I think we were face to face talking and the two of us started going back and forth. How can we do it without laying people off? How can we do this? And we were talking, if there were 220 some people, you know, a third of that is like 70 or 80. Wow. So how can we not lay off 70 people and still get the 30 or 40% savings that we needed to do? So, we, we really weren't coming up with any great ideas. We had some thoughts and both of us agreed. Uh, and Mike was super enthusiastic about this. Uh, we both agreed that we would talk to the management council on Monday and delay this notice of a reduction in workforce. Wow. We, we reconvened the management council meeting and said almost uh, in an order, come up with a different plan. That does not have a single layoff. Ah. We then stopped talking and let them come up with a plan. And we said, we're going to convene this meeting tomorrow. Tomorrow, You got 24 hours to come up with a plan. Think of something. What a, I, I just want to insert there that that is, I've heard many people as I'm having conversations about how to endure hard things, it feels like for most of us, there needs to be a moment where we flip the switch and try to get creative. We say, if I can't change what this is, how can I change the way I'm approaching it? And it just strikes me 
that that seems to be a common theme among these stories. And these stories are not the same at all. You're talking about business. Other people I'm talking to are talking about terrible loss or about um, having to live with a decision that they've made to, to live overseas or to do something. But it strikes me that that is a key moment. Right. So we had the meeting on um, Tuesday, which was 24 hours later. And there was a whole bunch of ideas, some brainstorming that went around. Some of it was work sharing. Some of it was some staggered layoffs. We phone calls to the state of New York weren't helpful because we there was some prejudice. We couldn't. There was some discrimination. We couldn't lay off some people and not other people. Ah. So, so the the whole thing kept growing, and one idea kept coming around was how can we share this this pain and in hindsight thinking about it the people making decisions about who are going to get laid off are generally not the people going to get laid off Uh. so um and those are the people that need it the most Mm -hmm. you know yes the executives the people on this management council the senior leadership team the supervisors the foreman certainly mike and i as owners I mean, we had the financial resources to weather this storm, but the people that we were thinking of laying off did not. Uh. So there was a person who suggested the idea that why don't we all share it? Why doesn't everyone take like a 30% cut in pay? Wow. And everyone, it was like an aha moment. Everyone kind of looked around and said, yeah. Yeah, why don't we think about that? Wow. And we had some re- we had some really smart people who were uh, spreadsheet wizards, ah. and we started coming up with ideas of how we would do that. You know, perhaps we had some older people that might want to just take that bucket list vacation, and they would you know take use up all their vacation time if that was three or four weeks they had. You know, maybe they would take another three weeks of unpaid. We put some, we put some volunteer uh, notions in the plan. Fantastic. You know, we, everybody took a pay, and Mike, uh, Mike, and I took a very substantial cut in pay, which we could afford. But just to show by leadership that we were doing it. That's and, important that for the leader to go first and to make the deepest cut. That feels huge. It, it, and it, 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 it just, it was like an amazing momentum happened. All of a sudden, they all started, they all, there was uh, six of them, and Mike and I, so there was eight of us, and we were getting so pumped up about this oh. idea that it got finalized, so we had, let me think, two more days to put all the details together, came up with a plan, and that was Tuesday. Thursday of the following week, we had an all-hands meeting in the cafeteria, and we announced our, our – we didn't even announce it. Mike and I didn't do it. We let our general manager do it. And the general manager, a really smart guy, got up, and everyone thought for sure that we were going to announce a layoff. Oh. And the first thing he said, nobody is going to lose their job. Oh. And he then said, but – all of us are going to feel a little bit of pain for a few months. It was a, a, a standing ovation. No, wait, is that the, is it ever, it was a standing ovation in the room that day. Yep. Oh, Absolutely. huge. Standing ovation. Yep. Even yep. though they heard, they heard that there's going to be a little bit of pain, but it was the yep. saving of the job. Their deepest fear was averted. Correct. And by the way, a little bit of pain, we, we emphasized a little, you know, it, it wasn't going to cripple anybody but everybody would feel a little pain rather than 30 percent feeling 100 percent pain yeah yep 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 wow that is that when you think back to that moment how do you feel oh it was uh, you know i don't think i realized then how how great it was and um you know it was survival and you know something i think the person listening to this talk right now might think it was noble and it it was but you know something it made financial sense Uh. because because had we had we laid off those 70 or 80 people we would have lost maybe 30 40 50 percent of them never would have come back 
And we had so much money invested in their training and everything we've done for them and they've done for us that it may not only, you know, a good thing to do, but it made financial sense not to lose those employees. That's so wise. You know, I think a lot of us maybe feel a little bit um, uncomfortable with the term that's been used for personnel in the past generation. Human resources almost makes it sound like people are iron ore and copper. And but but let's be honest. Your best resources in an organization are the people you've trained and 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 the culture they've been initiated into. And you're right, no business leader, no leader could ever get that back if they lost it. You let go so much accumulated wisdom and and experience. What a loss that would have been. Absolutely. You know, I never heard that analogy that you just came up with. Yeah. Uh, human resource, but it, it's absolutely true. Mm. And and um, if, if you really believe that your people are your biggest resource, then your first solution is not a reduction in workforce or a layoff or a furlough. I mean, it's possible that's necessary. Mm. And COVID-19, this pandemic, I think, is more troublesome than what I went through. Yeah. Uh, but it, 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 at least you don't default to that right away. You know, think of something different. And you know, I think what's great is that you're willing to talk to us just about a story. It's not a one-size-fits-all prescription, but it's, it's obvious that these opportunities are here. And, I, you know, I just have to say, since our, a lot of our listeners are going to be listening to this during the COVID-19 time, some might listen to it at a later point. And if so, please, you know, reach back in time and tell us how it turns out because we're, we're really dying to know. This is a very anxious time for all of us. But I am struck by the fact that now that your employees had chosen either voluntary furlough for a little while, maybe some unpaid time so they could, you know, work on the house a little bit, but you also had, uh, you know, a reduction in hours. Your, your, your production line was so slowed. And I know that right now, during the time that we're talking, there are a lot of organizations that know that their production is is just not going to work. So they've had to reinvent things. And I, I'm thinking right now, a lot of the distilleries here in the Capital Region and in the Berkshires have stopped cr- making spirits and, and ciders and beers, and they've begun using their production line for hand sanitizer. Uh, the, in the news right now is the fact that the big automakers in Michigan are now transferring their production lines to make ventilators. And and I know that a part of your story, I don't know all the details, but I know that a big part of your story was temporarily reinventing people's job descriptions and and giving them work to do that they'd never done before. And and that turned out surprisingly. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, that's that that's a really good point. I've forgotten that I had mentioned that to you. Um so there's no manufacturing to be done in the plant, right? Uh, for any commercial. So we've got we've got welders, we've got draftsmen, we've got machinists, we've got fabricators, and we really don't have any work for them to do. So we just des- we decided who better to sell to go out and market our company than the people that actually make the parts. Mm. So what we did, we took all these. Um, hourly employees and said you're going to be salespeople or you're going to be like an ombudsman to our customers so we had them man phones and call our customers and ask them for work uh when airplane traffic resumed we put them on airplanes and we had them we had them go to seattle we had them go to connecticut we had them go to san diego Meet with nothing was more powerful than sending a welder into Boeing oh. saying, I've got, I've got no work to do in my company. You've got to give us work. And they said it in a very uh, simple, you know, non eloquent yes. way. Yes. Uh, where a polished salesperson might go in there well dressed, you know, look super duper sharp yeah. and convince them to give us work. These welders and fabricators were our best salespeople ever. I can't imagine the power of that for a Boeing executive to sit across from a welder who says, I this is my work, this is this is the pride of my life, this is the fruit of my hands and my labor. 
and I want to go back to work. You have to help me. Well, they weren't that quite understanding, but, but, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it, well, that's if I were a welder, that's what I would have said. <laughs> no, it was it was really really. As a matter of fact, it worked the other way because when these folks went out there these um, hourly workers, and then they came back to Koksaki mm. and, went, and went in the factory when things started getting better. They had a new appreciation for the work they were doing for their our customers. Uh. So I remember people getting upset with us when there was some delays and, you know, I met that person and they got to get this part and blah, blah, blah. So oh, it was wow. amazing how, how, yeah, the synergies that developed from that, not just them getting us work, but they became a representative of our customer inside our four walls and they became lobbyists for the customer, which was fabulous. Oh, that is the best. That is the best. Yeah. So any yeah, antagonism yeah. that would have been there was just dissolved. Correct. Wow. Wow. So how long can you take us through a bit of a timeline? We all know Tuesday, September 11th, 2001. We remember it well. How long were the hard times? How long were the reductions in pay? And then what was it like to emerge from that? It, it, it lasted, as they predicted, about three to four months before orders started trickling in. Ah. So they were, they were pretty accurate with that. But what happened, we hoped to get about 30 percent. And we were we were really uh, very, very measured how we measured this with all the spreadsheets we had and all the volunteer time off so that we were looking to get 30 percent. We wound up getting right away almost 50 percent. Wow. So we actually were doing better than we thought. And oh. we had to so we actually backed off on some of these uh, policies and within three months, maybe no more than four months, uh, everybody was back at full, full salary, uh, orders were coming in. And, uh, so four months of, you know, modest pain. Yeah. And, and, and we never lost an employee, never, never lost or laid off one employee. On. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Right. Did, was recovery, did, I mean, you. this business uh, did find its way back as all aeronautics businesses did. What was, what was the growth like after the crisis was ended? Well, that's a really good question. All that pent up uh, goodwill that we got, not just from us to our employees, but from our employees to our customer and cussed back and forth. It was, it was powerful. Oh. It, it was, it, it was unbelievable how we rebounded. As a matter of fact, better than we had ever predicted. Wow. Uh, we wound up, we wound up having a really a, another good two, three, four years and reached our next level of growth. It was bad. Oh, it's such a great story. Now, and, and not only that, I wasn't here at the time. This, this predates me in town, but I have heard that Dynabil Industries got recognized for this at a very high level. Can you talk to us? Was it 2005 when, when the company received recognition for this? It, it was. And that, you know, it, it but the company, it, it takes a village, and um, the employees deserve the credit. But as as in many ways, both Mike and I were honored as New York State Business Person of the Year. Oh, I love it. And, and we went to Washington, D.C. and met then-President George Bush. Wow. Uh, we, didn't win, we did not win the national award, but we won New York State's uh, Business Person of the Year. So we were honored. And, um, oh, I love it. It was, it was really nice. Yeah. It, it's just, you know, we, we, we live in an era where a lot of us hold our breath wondering are, you know, you hear, you hear the cynical view in society often is nice guys, you know, finish last. And you, you guys weren't just nice guys. You were business people who made decisions that were based in, in reason and, and, and logic. But but you took a courageous. You started with that that creative moment where you said, "Here, here's the challenge. Come up with a plan with no layoffs." You you followed it through. You were willing to take the pain, 
And the result is so beautiful. It feels like that is exactly what we want our business leaders to be able to do. And and we're we're having this conversation in an era where, I mean, right now, currently in New York State as we speak, there are only a few categories of businesses that are even allowed to operate. Many, many, many industries are considered non-essential right now, and they are these business owners are in real distress. Even our uh, even our our food outlets, you know, our restaurants, they can only do takeout uh, and delivery. So the business owners of of New York of America are listening right now trying to find out what to do with their challenge of, of, of the year 2020. What, what message would you, someone who, I mean, you don't need to, September 11th is the perfect example of a crisis that was devastating. And uh, it was devastating in many, many ways, but you had the misfortune at that time of being in an industry that was directly affected. Dire- I mean, a, a, just a full on hit. What is your, what is your message to today's business leaders who are at a critical time making very important, impactful decisions that are going to affect a lot of people? Uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's really simple. And uh, it goes back to what we talked about a few moments ago. And what is your biggest resource? And uh. we, bo- we both agree, we both agree that it's people. And if, and no one plan fits everybody. What I did, or we did rather, uh, a while back, isn't what somebody might do today. But whatever they do, if they start out by thinking the one thing they've got to protect, preserve, keep is employees or people, and do it, do it without um, laying off people. Or now the word is furloughing. Yeah, and. I think when you first think about it, you say you can't do it. But if you really, really, really think about it mm. and and scratch your head and ask your people, what can we do? People will come up with great ideas and not always the leaders, but ah. it's the leader's job to get people to come up with those ideas. I see it happening all the time. I mean, look at all the restaurants now that are starting to do OK. Yes. Uh, without serving food in their four walls. It's amazing. You know, they, they've come up with creative ways to, to serve. And then there'll be other restaurants that might close or go by the wayside because they just closed up and said, oh, I can't do this. Right. You know, right. And they know they, they, it's, I guess you can use that kind of thinking out of the box, thinking differently. So, you know, my advice is think of your people as your biggest asset and whatever plan you come up with, make it keep them. Oh, it's, it's so, yeah, it's so important. I I love that. I love that. And, you know, it's interesting because you guys are involved in a lot of stuff in the community. I mean, you, uh, Peggy, you also, uh, have worked in, in the community very closely in real estate. You've done a, a lot of, um, a lot of service for a lot of people. There's a lot of people who will say, oh yeah, Peggy quickly helped me uh, sell my house. Or, uh, oh yeah, no, I worked for Dynabill Industries. There's a lot of people connected to you. But one of the connections that's really the the nicest is the back to the story of what happened on that Sunday when you looked around the church and you saw these families, 20 or so families that were just sitting there who would be very affected by your decisions. Tell me, you guys are you guys are regular churchgoers. You're uh, unless you're traveling or unless you're in quarantine or something. You're you're almost always at the seven thirty mass. And I'm curious about maybe expanding beyond this story. But how does your faith and the values that that you uh, you embrace how does that affect your decisions in life? How how does how does your the choices you've made to be churchgoers, people who uh, practice faith, how does that affect the way that you operate? Well, I guess I guess I would say that we're all part of God's family, and I mm. feel that way when I'm at St. Mary's. I feel like that I'm there with my family, which is an extended family, a mm. community, and I, I just feel like we're all connected in our faith, I guess, and mm. even people who are not members of our church are still part of our family. Um, 
I guess we're, we're supposed to take care of each other and we're supposed to do good when we can do good. Mm. Um, I have this quote on my desk that says, do all the good you can in all the ways you can, to all the people you can, in every place you can, and all the times you can, as long as every you can. Oh, so, uh, that's powerful. Just, yeah, and I just I just think we try to live by that. We try to do the right thing. We, we are so grateful to God for all of the, the things that we have. And I think we have an obligation and a share and do right and i and i I, i'm sure it's faith-based but i like to think that that everyone would think that way yeah whether they're catholic or not yes yeah i hear that what a world it can be what a world it can be I uh, I have a couple more questions I'd really like to ask you guys because I'm asking everybody in this series these questions. They, they seem to be some questions that have been coming up a lot in conversation for people because we're in a time of crisis. And I'm wondering, when you think back to, to the, the adventures of your life, obviously the, the 2001 crisis at, at Dinaville Industries was not the only one you faced in your life. A lot of people take comfort or, or they frame their life by the phrase, everything happens for a reason. Do you believe that? That's a very, it's a very interesting thought. Do you believe that everything happens for a reason? Do you think that's true? You know, I, it, that's a hard thing to answer because sometimes the things that happen are, are so bad that you think, well, what could possibly be the reason? Mm. But yeah, I, I actually think I do. I kind of think that you could get something out of every situation or learn something or, and, and it happens. Maybe we're supposed to find our way out or help people or whatever we're supposed to do Mm. is the result of what happens. So Mm. I guess, I guess, yes, I I think I do. I always think there's no such thing as coincidences. Things happen for reasons. Yes. Yes. I hear that. Uh, Hugh? Um, no, no, I, I don't think things happen for a reason and um i kind of been biting my lip a little bit i i don't think i'm as faithful as you are implying that i am i mean i believe in something and um but i i don't think things happen for a reason i think they're random i think they happen and i think Mm. if you have good if you have good values and you have you know like a good compass Mm. you just you do the right thing and i i think when things happen, it kind of forms you. Um, I don't think they happen for a reason, but how you deal with them, uh, I think, shapes you. Yeah. And you know, Hugh, I'm so glad you said that because I think a lot of listeners can really relate to that. You're, you're somebody who is uh, faithfully at church, but the reasons that bring you to church may not be the reasons that bring Peggy or the others in the pews around you. And I think that's... <laughs> That's really true for a lot of people. I think that's true. Yeah. I think there are as many reasons to go to church as there are people in church. And I just really appreciate that as you're as you're going on your journey of life and that uh, church remains a part of it for you. And I mean you've you've put a lot of time and energy into into this church community. And so it obviously matters to you, even if the way your faith life looks is not like your wife's or your or your friends or some other people in the community. I think that's pretty important for people to know. So I appreciate you saying it. Yeah, that's well said. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, uh, I'm wondering, the topic of this whole series is endurance because there's so many people that are not sure how they're going to endure the the health crisis, the fear of the economy, the worries about livelihood, the this is really a perfect storm for a lot of people, the coronavirus epidemic. In your experience, this challenge that we talked about tonight, but also the others, which we would never have time to go into in one conversation, what do you think is the key to to enduring something? What's the key to the virtue of endurance? Well, um, I think... And in, in all my life, all our lives, I believe that persistence, ah. you know, keep on, keep on, keep doing it. If, if you have a plan or if you have a strategy, uh, it takes time and it takes endurance. It, endurance isn't a word I'd use. I'd use persistence, but ah. it's endurance. Uh-huh. It's, it's definitely endurance because you just got to keep on, keep on. You got to keep the ball moving. And mm. it, it all comes to play. If you've got a good strategy and you're going down the right path, you just got to keep on doing it. Mm. And I, I, I think during this crisis, 
we just keep on doing it. I'm sure we get depressed, but you, you just got to keep keep going. Amen. You know? Yeah. Peggy, how about for you? I think what he was just saying, keep your eye on the prize. Uh, you know, yeah, right. Just just know where you want to go and and just I keep the faith. And, and I think most of getting achievements are believing you can do it. Mm. And I know you were talking about the different ways businesses in our small town have reinvented themselves. Mm. And I so admire them. And I think you have to be flexible and you have to be willing to change the way you've always done something. And I think in the end, people are going to be doing business a lot differently in the future because they now realize they can. Yes. So I I think we're going to learn a lot. And I think just, just knowing that you're going to be all right in the end. If it's not all right, it's not the end. I love it. I love it. That's it. That's it. Yeah. And for the, some of you may, you know what we'll do? Maybe we'll make this a prize like they, like elementary school teachers do. If you can name the first person to tell us what movie that comes from, we'll mail you a St. Mary's t-shirt. <laughs> I think that's a great idea. <laughs> all right. The last question, and I, I could talk to you all night, but we've got the rest of our lives, so I enjoy that that fact. And I know our, our listeners are going to want to to get to know you too, so we might have to have you back for another conversation. But tell me about where you sit right now. You've been in, in, in self-imposed quarantine based on your travels. You chose to protect the community, which we're so grateful for. And then as soon as you were ending your quarantine, our governor said, no, no, it's, we've got to flatten this curve. Everybody really needs to keep it just to the essentials. So, um, we're in the middle of this right now. We're still in the thick of it. Tell me what are your, Peggy, you started to, to share a little bit about this perhaps now. What are your best hopes for what life will be like? Not just business, but all life. What do you think are the best possible fruits that could come from this terrible challenge? I think gratitude. I think, I think you know, I, I keep seeing on Facebook, and that's all I want to do is go back to the life I had and realize, you know, you don't realize what you have until you lose it. Oh. So... I, I think I think um, also that a lot of us are going to realize that we don't need as many things as we thought we did. Um, uh. we don't, you know, and, and I think it's, it's been good. It's been good for me. I, I'm an extrovert. I'm always need to be around people. And for the last five weeks, I've been <laughs> housebound, and I'm I'm okay. I'm wow. A, I didn't, and I kind of like it in some ways. Maybe I'm going to be an introvert the rest of my life. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but I think gratitude. I walk around and I am so grateful for where we live. Um, and I, I'm a New Yorker. I'm in, I'm a Queens girl, born and raised. And I think of people in New York City and I, I'm just, I feel so badly for them and I'm so grateful I don't live there anymore. That's uh, a terrible thing to say, I guess. Yeah. But we live in such a beautiful spot and I appreciate it. I, I look at the leaves, every bud that comes out, I'm like, look at that. It's, oh, what a great well, thing. Yeah. From now on, I think hopefully we'll be more grateful for every little thing. I love, that's a great hope. I share it. I share it. And I'm noticing it in myself too. I really love that. Hugh, what, what's yours? Uh, as I had time to think. Um, I, I hope after this is all over that we'll be much kinder. Yeah. And I think, and very importantly, I hope we will be less partisan. Yes. Uh, I hope we will rethink um, essential workers and how we treat them. Yes. Uh, I know I sound a bit like Bernie Sanders now, but you know, a minimum wage of fifteen dollars an hour doesn't seem like so much when these are the people we all depend on right now. Uh. And. Uh, and, and the whole partisan thing, the way this country is so divided that we often don't do things in the best interest of everybody. We do things in the best interest of some. So uh, I hope we learn a valuable lesson. I hope our leaders learn a valuable lesson yeah. uh, during all this. And, and and the people that we never really gave credit, you know, oh, my God, those EMTs and mm. Grocery workers. Grocery workers. You know, we're seeing, yeah. yeah. Everybody, you know, they, and oh. they, they, they make the, you know, the least amount of money. I, I heard an interesting thing. They, they 
say that uh, the person that bags your groceries or or the person who's UPS has now become more important than your lawyer. It's, oh, <laughs> it's so true. It is so, and they're the only things keeping peace right now because you know that if the if we lost the access to the grocery stores people's anxiety levels and aggression would be really, it would be difficult. It would be so yeah, difficult. No kidding. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. You know what has touched me, I have to say to my two New Yorker friends here, is uh, the pluck of, of that city, which of course is, is the anchor of our region. For those of uh, in our area, New York City is really our, our navel. And um, just that the footage they have of every night at 7 p.m., all of Manhattan opens their windows and does a full cheering ovation for all the healthcare workers every single night. I, I, I think New York, there's nothing like New York City to me. There's the, the resiliency of New Yorkers oh. and the spirit of New Yorkers. And listening to our governor every day, he is so, his leadership, and he's a typical New Yorker. You know, uh. I just, I, I think the, the best of us is going to come out. I hope so. I just, in the news this week when we're talking is the fact that the Javits Convention Center got turned into the biggest hospital in the country overnight. You know, these things that are happening. Saint jo the Cathedral of St. John the right. Divine is a exactly. hospital. That kind of innovation, you know, uh, yeah, that's what we come from. That's our stock. So you're right. Hugh, all of these petty fights that we've been getting into, you know, in the past little bit of history, we're, we're better than that. We can't, we can't just sink to that. Yeah. Right. It's uh, very... That's, 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 that's our wish uh, for after this. Oh, it's a beautiful wish. So I, I want to turn to the to the listeners now for just a second because I think we've heard a lot of beautiful thoughts and I'd just like to ask you before we conclude, take a second and just see if there was anything said that maybe was a new thought for you. Maybe it was something about the business. Maybe you had never considered the approach or some aspect of the approach that Dynabil took. Or or maybe there was some some aspect of the conversation about life life now and what life could be that is is a new thought for you take a second to just savor that and and see if there's anything you can pull into your life is there is there anybody you want to send this conversation to do you know a business leader who's in the middle of sleepless nights and and stress and is trying to figure out what he or she could possibly do to uh to keep their organization going uh, is there any any new hope that you have that you didn't have before listening to this? Hugh and Peggy Quigley, I am so grateful for the conversation and I'm so lucky to be your pastor so that I get to look forward to more of these. And I thank you for your time and I thank you for the opportunity to, to chat about something so important. And uh, I know that if anybody wants to talk more about this, you can contact me and I, I can get you contact information for Hugh and Peggy. So they'd be happy, I know, to, to talk to any business leader who needs to hash this out. So uh, I'm grateful for the time and grateful for your listening. Uh, so farewell and God bless you all. Thank you for the opportunity. Good night and thank you for having us. Oh, thank you.